the questions about that um, offline, but I think in general, the key is really just don't think about it too much and just try to um, listen to what's happening with the patient. So the depth can vary and so forth. You don't even have to go that deep on those muscles to get a very strong Dutch she reaction. Um, you know, as far as like techniques go, um, just reference what we talked about last week. Some of that stuff is a little complicated to try to explain in this format. And that'll be the same today as well. So I'm gonna go over some different trigger points and some different ideas, but obviously, you know, in this format, it's not the same as a hands-on learning experience. For some of you out there that have experience with this, you'll pick up what I'm saying pretty quickly. For other people, I understand that this may be totally new. You've never done this before, or you're still in school. So um, just, you know, you know, just take what you can. Um, it's pr a pretty long journey to really grasp a lot of this information. It's simple, but as you go into it, it can become pretty complex. But at the end of the day, once you really have done this for a long time and you've really, you know, applied it and used the anatomy and so forth, it is still simple, but it's just getting to that realization. So, um, and if there is questions after this, you know, Josh and I are pretty available. So, you know, just, just let us know. Um, so before we start, um, Josh, you, is there anything you wanted to say before, before I go into it? No, that's it. I, really, it's just great to have you here. Really excited to be doing this with you, Jamie. And, um, you know, definitely this is a learning experience for all of us, both the online and the, the material itself. Uh, so, you know, please be, uh, do reach out to us if you have questions and, and so on. And, you know, hopefully you can take a seminar with one or either of us down the line and, and see how to do this and like really feel it with your hands because there's really no substitute for the, for the hands-on uh, in the end. So uh, with that, take it away, Jamie. Just let me know when you want to pop okay. slides. Okay, let's go, let's, um, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, so this is uh, my equation, TRP to the third power. So for those of you guys who know trigger points, TRP is the abbreviation for trigger points um, to the third power. So let's talk about that. So the first check mark here says it's a tender point that reproduces pain. If you're not familiar with trigger points, this is pretty much the easiest way to just understand like what we're really looking for when we see the patient. So we're looking for a tender point that reproduces pain. That's a key statement because there's a lot of tender points in the body. And I think, you know, when we talk about osher points, we say, you know, okay, that could be a tender point. But, you know, when you break down what osher means, it's like, oh, yes, that's the spot. Why would a patient say that? They would say that primarily because you found their pain. And you can also, you know, label this the concordant pain, concordant sign. It's the pain that brought the patient into the clinic to see you today. It's not some other pain or some other thing that you, know, you just found some spot that's tender. It is their pain that you just found. And it's pretty miraculous. You guys know, I mean, a lot of you guys have experience, but just from just speaking more to the, you know, the, the students out there, or the new practitioners, um, the look on a patient's face when you put your hands on them and you find their pain that nobody's been able to find, it's, you know, that's a pretty, you know, special moment where you connect with the patient and they know that you know, you know, what, what you're looking for basically. Um, so that develops trust right off, right off the bat. Um, the next TRP mnemonic that I got going here is the top band that with a referral pattern. So when you press these tender spots, you're looking for a tender spot, but also you're looking for the top band or the knot in the muscle. And if you can isolate that, that's even better. So, you know, it's like a compass, like you find this rope and then you just follow this rope and you're trying to find the tightest spot on that rope. And that takes a little practice and you'll notice the more you palpate is that, that tight spot tends to show up in, you know, 
regions that are reproducible. You know, it's pretty rare that someone gets a knot in their trapezius that's not around GB21 or Sanjiao 15. You know, it's like it's it's usually pretty predictable in the sense that it tends to show up in the middle of the muscle um, belly, right? Centralized, and that you know, in the same in the same sentence is you know typically where the motor point is found. So there's a lot of overlap between motor points and trigger points. Um, so we're not only looking for a tender spot, we're looking for the top band. And if it has a referral pattern, that's also helpful. But for me, the way I utilize that piece of information is, here's an example. A patient has pain in the front of their shoulder, right? And then you examine them and you check the back of their shoulder and you check small intestine 11 and you press that spot and it commonly reproduces pain in the front of the shoulder. So that's where the referral pattern matters, matters to me because I'm still trying to find the concordance sign. I'm trying to find your pain, what brought you into the office. And it may not be where your pain is, right? So, you know, we often share these quotes in the groups and things that, you know, you know, the person who often treats pain, the site of pain is lost and so forth. You don't want to get confused in the story of, here's my pain right here. Sometimes it's that simple. It really is right there. Other times it's not. And that's where our uh, experience comes in. And that's why we study so much, right? Um, the last thing is the twitch response pinpoints it. So if you can get a twitch response in a muscle, um, that is a good indication that there's a trigger point there. And when you read Travell and Simon's book, Myofascial Pain and Dysfunction, which everybody should have if they're going to treat trigger points, it was interesting, Josh, how we posted that, that uh, quote in the last week in the group. And I was surprised how many people don't actually own these books. You know, when I talk to people like Josh or, you know, all the other colleagues out there that have been doing this, and it's kind of like common sense, like everybody has this book. You have to have this book. It's literally the Neijing of trigger points. Um, I personally own almost every single book that was written on trigger points. And there's not really much that's added. You know, some people add like, you know, a couple of gems here and there, or their own, their own way of interpreting some of this information. Um, some books are good with you know, keeping up to date on the research, but the core foundation that you need to apply this as an acupuncturist are in Travell and Simon's books. And that's all the books you really need actually to just get going. So um, I was really surprised, actually, I didn't, I didn't realize so many people had not owned these books yet. I kind of just thought of everybody has that already. But yeah, if you don't have those books, you have to have those books. Those, those are the aging of trigger points. So um, in those books, you'll find, you know, some statements in there that say the twitch response is a very specific finding. And when I say specific, that means it's, you know, helping you to rule in that you've got the right diagnosis that this is the trigger point location. So if you see a twitch response, it's very helpful to show you that, yes, there's a trigger point here. And there's two types of uh, twitch responses that you'll observe. One is just a, you know, like a clunk of the muscle where you'll, you'll see like, you know, this major like, you know, clunk, clunk, like you're strumming over a muscle. That's one definition of trigger points. And I didn't know that until I had actually studied Janet Travell's work with her videos and saw her palpating trigger points. I didn't know that that counted as a twitch response. And when you, know, when you see that, you're like, oh, that's not as complicated as I thought it was. The twitch response that I used to think you had to get was the fasciculation, where the muscle just starts rippling. So for example, like I'll press on large intestine six on a lot of patients with the Quervain syndrome, and their thinner eminence will start fasciculating. And that happens not often, but it happens, you know, you know, it happens, you know, every you know, couple months or so, where you'll see the thinner eminence just start quivering from the pressure at large intestine six. These are totally different muscles. These are innervated by totally different nerves. So there's that, you know, there's that chi response that we always talk about with Chinese medicine. It makes no sense when you look at the anatomy and the nerves, like why is it doing that? It's amazing to see these kind of twitch responses. Um, and that's very special. And I kind of discovered that on accident. Like nobody taught me that, even though that's what people were trying to convey. I had to just kind of learn that through, through accident by noticing that in the clinic. Um, I've had some patients who've had um, surgeries of their shoulder and things where you strum over their, um, for example, their deltoid and their brachioradialis twitches. 
you know, and it's like, that just doesn't make sense. You know, there's different, you know, just different muscles, different regions. It's pretty special. And a picture that always comes to my mind is in Dr. Wong's book, um, Implied Channel Theory, you know, he used to always talk about skipping stones, you know, and getting, you know, across the water, like you're throwing the stone and getting it to skip and you create this rippling effect. When you observe that in the clinic, it's like, there it is. It's that rippling effect and it just goes. Um, that's something that if anybody ever captures that on video, can you please share that? I've, I, I'm, I never have a camera available, you know, when I, when I see those kind of things, but that's pretty amazing to, to witness if you've never seen that. And that happens fairly often. Like to see that rippling effect in general, you know, I'll see that a couple times a week in the clinic, but it's just random. I can't predict when that's gonna happen. But um, that large intestine six to the thinner one, that doesn't happen too often, but it's pretty cool when it does. And when you needle it, you'll start to see the same thing. The muscle just starts freaking out, quivering, you know, fasciculating, you know, until it's done. So that's a little bit of a tangent, but it's just something that interests me that I thought I would share. So TRP to the third power, that's the mnemonic to understand the definition of trigger points. You don't need to have all these things to diagnose a trigger point. You only need one. So you can just literally find a tender spot, but it should be their pain. It should be concordant with their pain to be diagnostic. Um, the more of these things that you find, the more you can start leaning on your diagnosis and yeah, that's probably what's going on. If you only have one of these things, then you know, you know, there, there's some room for error, obviously. So try to try to uh, observe that as much as possible. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. So what I, what I plan to do is, I, you know, when I was thinking about this, I think we have a pretty short amount of time and I just wanted to share a few points that you already use in clinic and just show you, you know, how I use those points and how those points relate to trigger points. So the first one, everybody knows gallbladder 21, right? So that's, you know, one of the most famous points for shoulder and neck pain. I'm not going to list out all the referral patterns and things like that, but what's, what's really cool about this point is this, this is a good, like, you know, entryway into trigger points. If you never studied trigger points, this will get you to believe in trigger points and that it's the same as acupuncture and the pain referral patterns are the same as the channels, um, which has been researched. I didn't put, post the research here, but there's a couple of really good studies that show how much overlap there is. And, you know, we're talking about over 90% of the same things here, 90% of the same point location, 90% plus of the referral patterns following the channels, 90% plus having the exact same pain indications that are listed in our textbooks that are the same thing that were observed when they were researching trigger points. So in this point here, what I want you to notice is the bottom of the picture is gonna be the anterior portion of the body and up towards the top near the word gallbladder 21 is the posterior aspect. So when you look at the trapezius, I put a star where GB21 is this is how I interpret it. I mean, there's always room for error, and I don't know what people were thinking back in the days, but when, when you look at the name of this point, Jinjing, it's shoulder well. What does that mean? If you look here on this cadaver photo, and if you don't own this book, and you like treating shoulders, everybody should get this book. It has the best cadaver photos that I've ever seen. Um, very clean photographs. So what you can see here is there's a depression almost, like a cleavage between the middle and upper trapezius. And what's really cool is when you treat a thinner patient, you know, like those wiry body types, you know, those wood element types, if you just put your finger here lightly, you'll see this depression open up. Um, you won't see it on other patients who have like a lot of mass up there, but you know, in those thinner wood type patients, you'll see this, this, you know, canal, this shoulder well, so to speak, open up. And if you just touch that area, right, you, everybody has a knot right there. But, you know, this point taught me a lot in my career because sometimes it worked awesome. Like, that was it. One needle, boom, just that was it. Other times it was a total failure. And then I was like, is my diagnosis wrong? Or, you know, and then there's points where I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm almost 100% positive the diagnosis is right. I just missed the point. So it took me a long time to understand the nuances of GB21. And I'm just gonna introduce a couple of those now. So if you were to needle this star straight in, perpendicular, 
I know some of the textbooks say don't go perpendicular, it's dangerous. But if you if you go up to a half an inch, you know, on a patient who has a decent amount of mass, you're fine. This muscle is superficial. So you if you're going deep here, you already missed the point. But if you needle superficially perpendicular, you will get it if that's where it is. And so when I palpate this area, I feel for that shoulder well, so to speak, being full. And that's basically maybe a knot there, or it just feels like there's some resistance. It feels like you're uh, pushing a ball, trying to push an inflated ball underwater, like pushing back against you. That's how I know GB21 straight in is a good point for that patient to, to be needled that way, I should say. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So I did that for many years. And then as you look, if you needle anteriorly, if you start needling towards the front of the body, you get more of the upper trapezius here. And the upper trapezius is special because that's, you know, who doesn't have trigger points here? So what I'll do, if someone has more tension on the anterior part, portion of GB21, is I'll angle the needle anteriorly. And I'll usually use my finger in the front. This is really hard to explain on a webinar, but I'll put my finger on the front so the muscle doesn't have anywhere to escape. And then I'll just needle 45 degrees to the front of the body using my finger as a backstop with the muscle in between, okay? Um, it took me a while to understand that that was something I needed to do on those patients that weren't getting good results. I was just missing the point. And then other patients, if you press posteriorly, it's going to feel like this huge top band is more behind GB21. It's more going in the direction of Sanjiao 15. And so what I'll do in that case is instead of needling GB21 perpendicular, I'll angle it about 45 degrees plus or minus posteriorly. But the same thing, I'll use a finger or some, some way to, to support the muscle so that it doesn't escape, it doesn't move. And that is very effective. So just to recap, there's three ways that I needle this point. Either perpendicularly, because it feels full, it feels excessive, feels like I'm pushing a ball underwater at this point. I'll needle it anteriorly. If I feel like the top band is more fibrotic or tense at the front, of the of GB21, and when you're pressing on there, that's reproducing their concordant sign, meaning the symptoms that brought them in today. Or I'll needle it posteriorly if I again find the concordant sign with that particular method, and it's all based on palpation. So to to summarize, the, I don't know what I'm going to do until I actually see the patient and touch their GB21. So if I if I did the physical exam and I look, okay, this patient needs upper trapezius work or middle trap work. I have no idea what my needling technique is going to be until I actually feel the change in the tissue. And, and I might not just do one, I might do all three of these methods. And maybe all three ways are needed, you know, that chicken's foot technique, you know. So you just have to adapt to whatever you feel. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, one of my favorite quotes by Bruce Lee is like, don't think, feel. If you ever take my workshop, I always have this picture of Bruce Lee saying that under palpation because you don't have to know all the names of these muscles and things. You just need to be able to just quiet all that internal talk and just feel what's going on. And that's probably why it took me so long to understand how to needle this in different ways because my mind was saying, well, I learned it this way or I shouldn't do this. Don't even worry about it. Just trust your fingers. If, you, if your fingers are good, you know, your needling will be good. So if you palpate and really take your time with that palpation, and you put your needle in to follow where you, you know, to target what you palpated, you know, that's the best you can do. You gotta trust that, you gotta trust that process. And then if it doesn't work, then you just re-examine, maybe you gotta change the technique a little, or maybe the diagnosis was incorrect, who knows? Okay, so let me go to the next slide, please. That's GB21. Um, levator scapula. So levator, these two muscles, I mean, you can build your practice off the trapezius and levator scapula. Those two muscles alone, I mean, you treat those every single day. With the levator scapula, I like this quote from the, the Neijing Su Wen. So if the neck cannot move side to side, needle the arm major yang. So let's, let's interpret that. If you cannot rotate your head, needle a small intestine channel. So when you read something like this from the classics, you automatically know they do physical exam. How would you recognize this pattern if you did not check range of motion, right? You already know that they will watch like, oh, this person can't turn their neck. So this is going to be more of this channel. This person can't do this motion. So it's more of that channel. 
this is really inspirational because it's only one line, but what it's telling us is a lot. It's telling us that not just this motion, what about all the other motions? What about the things they didn't say? That, that you know, it was too much to carve in stone or just, you know, put on silk or dig into a tortoise shell. What, I mean, they give you these clues and if, if you take that principle and just apply that principle to everything, you can discover a lot on your own. So here, what we're saying is, is look, for, look for the range of motion that's restricted and start identifying the channels that are involved. And if you want to go deeper, understand the anatomy of those channels. You know, they, they didn't call it levator scapula 2000 years ago. You know, it didn't matter. It's still, it's still the same thing. Um, so with rotation of levator scapula, it tends to hurt more when you turn to the same side. So that's just the pattern of that muscle. Uh, it gets crampy, right? So when you turn to that same side, it doesn't like it, and it'll usually restrict your motion. That's how, that's, whenever you see that, you have to rule out levator scapula. But if you tuned in last week, I also said you have to watch out for lateral foraminal stenosis with that. So those are competing diagnoses, so you have to look for those patterns. Okay, so there's three, um, there's three points that I usually access for, for this muscle. So we know them. Small intestine 14 and small intestine 15 is two of them. So if you've ever needled those points, you're most likely needling the later scapula. Yes, the trapezius is over the top of it, but this is the ropey structure that you feel under there. As a side note, we talk about, okay, the, the Taiyang channels are easily affected by cold. And it took me a long time to come to this realization, but when you get cold, what's the first thing you do? You shrug your shoulders to keep your neck warm, protect your neck from the draft. Your levator scapula does not like that. Your levator scapula, that's what it does. Elevator to the scapula. So it has a few different actions, but one of them is to lift your scapula up. So when you're cold, man, that levator scapula gets pretty cranky. So um, I remember taking some classes where they said, you know, SI 14 and 15 would expel cold and so forth. And I just always wondered why. And I was like, well, here's just one possible explanation. Um, the upper star, this is a point that, it's not really a point, it's, it's a region. And it's really at the spot at the angle of your neck. So like if you make this C shape with your fingers, you can reach up in the angle of your neck. And if you do this combing motion side to side, you should feel this clunk if you get it just right it's pretty rare that somebody does not have a clunk in this muscle. It's tight on most people. What I find interesting is that when they do these workshops and things, a lot of people that, you know, that I know of that have experience with this, they still have a hard time locating the muscle at this area. And it's really by touch. Like if you get it, there's no doubt. I mean, this thing feels like a rope. So clunk, clunk. That's what you're looking for. But what's really fascinating about this muscle is that it, has attachment to you know, typically four of the cervical um, transverse processes. Now there's gonna be anomalies, okay? So it's not always just gonna be four, but the, the general basics is yes, C1 through C4, they come down and then they twist at the angle of the neck. So the muscle's a little thicker right there at the ang angle of the neck. And that's where you're feeling that clunk. Um, over the years, what I've found to be more helpful for, for locating this upper spot is to try to isolate which of these strands is the tightest. Like which one is really more involved than the other ones because our needles are pretty small, right? So we wanna be as specific as possible. Um, and it's, again, it's not a specific point. I don't do any measurements here. It's all based on touch. Sometimes it's underneath the trap. Sometimes it's way up higher. Let your fingers guide you. you know, don't think feel what's going on up here. And if you're, if, you know, if you're able to palpate the transverse processes, uh, I'm not going to go over how to do that right now and take up a lot of time, but you'll be able to, to trace which fibers are the tightest. And if you target those, good things happen. Um, you want to get more specific. If you look at the right shoulder, usually the, the strand that comes from C1 is going to be medial and C4 is going to be lateral. Um, so, you know, one's going to be medial, four is going to be lateral um, in general. And I, I usually just think of the right shoulder because SI 14, one, four. One is medial, four is lateral. It's SI 14, it's the same spot. 
helps me just keep that information straight in my own brain so that we don't go crazy learning all this. Um, so anyhow, um, would I need all three of these? Not necessarily. It's again, based on touch. For me, if I only had one needle and I could not physically examine the patient, I would choose the upper location or the middle location. Because again, trigger points like to uh, show up in the middle of a muscle fiber. A lot of people like SI14, which is also great. And that might be the key for some patients because when this is chronically tight, it becomes fibrotic and those changes can also, you know, create restricted mobility and so forth. But if I only had one needle, it's going to be in the middle to take tension off the entire chain. You know, I think of it as a rope that's attached to two points. If there's a knot in the middle of that rope, it's going to pull on those two points. If you can untie the knot in the middle, so to speak, it's going to take tension off of those two points. And so by untying the knot in the middle around SI15 up to that uh, Asher region, you're going to take tension off of SI14. The only time that doesn't work as well is when it's really chronic and it's really fibrotic, then you might need to do more local things. Uh, let me go to the next slide, please, Josh. Um, so here's a, a study just showing SI14 and what's going on here. This is a cool study because half of the people they studied, it was like 20 something people, but half of them have a bursa at SI14. The, a bursa, what is a bursa? It's a fluid filled sac that prevents friction between two surfaces, right? So you know, you're getting this friction, you're getting this irritation down here, and you might develop a bursitis here even. And that might be part of that gristle, that crunchy feeling that you're, you're getting in that area and that local pain that you're getting in that area. And I don't know, like, you know, everybody's experience, but if you needle a bursa, if it's irritated, it's like, you know, just basically like popping a water balloon. It helps decrease the pressure and reduces the pain very quickly. Um, so that's one of the benefits of just needling SI14 besides going for those fibrotic attachment points. Um, next slide, please. Um, anything, did you want to add anything, Josh? Uh, is the pace okay too? Uh, yeah, we're doing good. It's, we're at about one o'clock right now. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I can't, uh, I guess what I would say is just from like the sort of traditional functional medicine, uh, functional uh, musculoskeletal medicine of like Levitt and Yonda, they often say that levator first, trap second, that, mm -hmm. you know, you will clinically usually get a better res like long-standing result if you take care of levator first then traps it's just like one of those things like if you're just gonna do both it's fine but like you know levator and traps are like twins you know they're they, they look different but they but they're definitely like uh working together so um, yeah. a lot of times if you're like gb20 one just ain't doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, it's not doing it, and then come back to elevator. Yeah, good, good advice. All right, um, and then just one thing to add to is like, you know, I look at the upper trap and levator, it's kind of like this yin yang pairing. So they're synergists, they both elevate the shoulder, but you know, trapezius upwardly rotates, levator downwardly rotates. So, you know, a lot of times I'll look at the scapula too to see which, which part is tighter and usually focus on the muscle that's shortest. Um, and that, I mean, you can treat so many things just by doing that, not just neck pain, but shoulder pain, thoracic outlet. I mean, there's a tons of things you can address just by balancing the, that, uh, that out. Okay, semi-spinalis capitis. So let's look at this quote from the Neijing Su Wen, when the nape of the neck is painful and the neck cannot bend over or raise up, needle the leg major yang. So let's translate that. When you cannot flex or extend, let's needle the bladder channel. Um, Jing San Jen, this is the next three needles. This is from Dr. Jin's uh, three needle technique, which uh, I learned a little bit about when I was in school. Basically had three needles for all these different ailments and they work really well. But um, I looked into it a little bit with these three and found that his, his suggestion of using UB10, Bilao and UB11 targets very nicely the trigger points in the semi-spinalis capitis because if you see those white lines going transversely through the muscle, there's these tendinous inscriptions through the muscle, which make it almost like three different muscles. This is variable. Some people will only have one inscription and so forth, but let's just keep it simple. They got two in this photo here. And it's almost like your abdominal muscles, right? Like you have these different sections. So these three points 
specifically target each of these three sections. Um, and it's a, it works very well. So if the patient can ha cannot flex, they cannot touch their chin to their, you know, their sternal notch. If you needle these points and if it's coming from semi-spinalis capitis, you'll see a big change immediately after the treatment. Um, and it's consistent. And what you wanna do is just palpate and see if you can reproduce their discomfort, but it usually doesn't feel like a nodule per se. It just feels really hard and fibrotic and very much clunky when you strum across it. So just like playing the guitar string. But when, you, when you go across it, it just feels really hard, like clunk, clunk, and crunchy. You're most definitely gonna benefit from this treatment. So that's just something to consider. Um, for this particular muscle, again, the, the classics are giving us some clues about why we want to check range of motion on every patient. You know, you don't just start sticking needles in, you've got to figure out what channel or, you know, nowadays what muscles might be contributing. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, the splenius muscles are huge too. So um, basically, like splenius capitis and cervices, um, these guys are, are mostly involved with rotation that I see in the clinic. So on the left, you see capitis. On the right, you see services. So if a patient has difficulty with rotation, <coughs> excuse me, um, I usually think, you know, to check capitis, especially when they point to GB20 area, like they turn their head to the right and they point to the left GB20, you go, okay, I need to also double check and make sure that the splenius capitis isn't involved. Don't just assume that it's the trapezius and things. Um, this was, I remember treating this muscle back in like my first year or two of practice. And this was when I was getting some like one needle, um, treatments where the patients would be hundred percent better after one treatment with one needle when they just had an isolated splenius capitis strain for whatever reason. Um, and it's pretty obvious. I mean, it feels fibrotic. It feels like a hard knot when you palpate back there. For me, it's not really GB20. It's, um, in between GB20 and UB10, if you draw like a equilateral triangle, how do you draw that? How do you do that with your hand? Equilateral triangle. Just connect those two points. UB10, GB20. Draw a triangle down. That's usually where you're going to feel these oblique fibers angling towards the spine. Follow those fibers. Don't think. Feel. You'll feel a knot usually like at that equilateral triangle. That is, that's a money point right there for, for splenius capitis strain. A splenius service this is really challenging to palpate when you're first learning. Um, I would get, I would again, just kind of defer you to Travel's work and so forth, um, because this one is hard to explain in a webinar format, but I wanted to mention this because this muscle and the levator scapula are kind of like hand in hand, like they work together for that rotation. So if you're only treating levator scapula and the rotation is still kind of stuck, it may be splenius services. Um, you would know this though, like during your physical exam, just by touching the muscles, you'll feel, okay, where's the tension at? And you can literally do acupressure here or just hold your finger on the muscle and have them rotate again while you do something to distract that part of the muscle. And if their pain decreases and their range of motion improves, I'm treating that. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, it's not the easiest muscle to palpate when you're first learning back there though. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just in general, um, real quickly, there's some motor points that this study was, is new, 2020. But I thought it was really fascinating that uh, the motor point, the motor entry point, for the splenius capitis was bilateral um, and bilateral region, I should say. And the motor point for the splenius services region was uh, Ting Chuan, extra point. So earlier I said I use these for semi spinalis capitis, but that's underneath. So if you look at the layers, you got the trapezius, you got the splenius, you got the semi spinalis capitis, you got the multifidi. So by needling bilateral and Ding Chuan, you are getting the motor point, the motor entry point, I should say, of the splenius capitis and services. And you're also getting the trigger point for uh, semi-spinalis capitis at the same time. So that's, you probably need a bilateral and ding chuan hundreds of times, but now you just kind of understand what's underneath the skin there if you didn't know that already. All right, next slide, please. All right, that's it. So let me know if there's some questions. I hope that was uh, useful. And um, I'm sure Josh is going to blow your mind with what he's going to talk about next. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, my screen here. All 
Okay. Is that coming out full screen for you guys? Okay. So yeah, don't underestimate the value of uh, Darth Levader, as I like to call it, because it's evil and comes back. It, it was the bane of my practice for many years until I figured out how to get it reliably. And a lot of it was getting those upper, um, those upper couple trigger points rather than the lower one, which is kind of the more obvious one. So I found that getting more, I, I tend to use the, um, the middle one a lot. I find that that one will often, if you put, that's also, there's a motor entry point. If you run your pointer plus over it, you'll hear a whee right there. So it's like, boom, you hit that, zap it, and a lot of times Levator will, will behave. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about something a little, little different. Um, Jamie, if you don't mind uh, just keeping an eye on the Facebook, um, comments uh if the people are asking questions there um uh, i got this one i got i got some taken care of um okay but if you guys if you guys have any questions shoot shoot them out all right so um i'm going to talk a little bit today about vertebral mechanics and how you can use those um i will talk about the mechanics of the uh occiput uh and and atlas but the treatments I'm going to talk about are specifically more related to the more typical cervical vertebra. I'm not going to work the, um, I'm not going to show you too much about the upper ones. That would be a whole other discussion, which would be a lot of fun. I mean, we could, we could bust out any of these webinars into like a full weekend. This, we're just barely <laughs> scratching the surface. So I want to get to something that you'll, you'll be able to use, um, pretty quickly. So here's a, here's a picture here of the uh, atlanto-axial joint, uh, sorry, the uh, occipital uh, uh, atlantal joint, the OA, and the AA here. What, what this is from Kapanji, which if you don't have these books, they're awesome. It's, it, they're, um, it's a three-part seri three series on um, basically biomechanics and just amazing pictures. They've been around for a long time, but they're, they're now they're in color, the old ones weren't. Um, but what you can see is that the occiput, the condyles of the occiput sit on C1 and they do this kind of motion. It's really mostly uh, flexion and extension. You know, it's, I, I didn't include charts on, uh, on that, uh, but if you, you can say that roughly 50% of the ability of the uh, flexion extension of, of, the, of the head and neck happen at C0, so the occiput and C1, and about half of the rotation of the neck happen at between C1 and C2, roughly. Some studies show more, some studies show less, and it depends if it's passive, active, cadaver, and so on. There's a fair amount of variance on that, but that's just a rough, a, a rough, uh, a rough bit. And, and um, so here's a little uh, picture showing uh, the alar ligaments here, which are part of why you have that kind of wonkadoodle movement at the, at the occiput on C1. Here's C1, here's the occiput, here's C2. C1 coming around C2 and the alar ligaments coming off the dens of, of, uh, of C2 attaching up into the occiput. And that, those really modify the motions of the, um, of the spine there. Um, so that's, that's really helpful to know. So what we, we will see with restrictions of the occiput in particular, we'll see uh, often a uh, component of flexion and extension because that's the main motion along with a little bit of side bending tipping. And that's also, you know, we have the suboccipital muscles that also play a big role in that. And, and though that's very quite treatable through treating like the obliquus capitis and the rectus uh, capitis major minor, et cetera. Um, so that being like gallbladder 20, uh, do 16, those kinds of things are, are really quite effective for, for treating that kind of thing, just briefly as an aside. Here's a little bit about flexion and extension. Uh, here's the occiput. It rolls forward and tips backwards in extension and the reverse in flexion. You can, you can see that pretty easily. Although it's pretty hard to palpate in this area, 
because you have one, there's no transverse process or spinous process on uh, C1. And then there's also, there's, uh, you know, the angle of the uh, skull. Like it's actually really hard to palpate there because you have about this much muscle. You have a good like four or five centimeters of, of muscle there. Uh, the the um, suboccipital muscles are almost, uh, uh, parallel to the ground you know they're not in the books they always look really vertical but in reality they're really at an angle like this so just keep that in mind uh, when you're palpating there there's a lot of times the one of the more effective ways to needle in there in that region and safer even is because you don't have to worry about the vertebral artery so much is that you needle from below up and you can get into like along those attachments and into the into the suboccipital muscles a lot in some ways a little easier and have a clearer idea of where you're at safety wise. Um, here's the uh, uh, axis moving on the atlas, C1 on C2. What's just kind of interesting here is that you actually have a convex to convex relationship here. So um, this is part of, I think, why uh, with muscle tension in the suboccipital muscles, you can see those restrictions at C, between C1 and C2. It's really common. And so that when you get like more compression, you're actually just sort of build a sliding that knuckle down behind the other one. Does It, it just doesn't want to move as easily. Uh, these are primarily rotational restrictions you see here. Um, but, you know, I honestly, I get pretty good results just uh, with rotational restrictions, just taking care of like sternocleidomastoid and so on. That usually will we'll take care of that for some other reasons that I won't get into. Okay, another picture of C1 rotating on C2. Just note all the ligamentous structure here. This is the transverse, this is the, these are the transverse ligaments and so on. Really important. This is why. Um, these are actually very weak in people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. They degenerate. Okay, so just to get our orientation on the more typical seg segments, here's, you know, say C3, C4 down to C5, C6 or so. Um, and uh, in neutral position, what's going to happen when you go into extension over here on the left side of the screen is that you're going to have a closure of the facet joints here. Okay. And these are, you're going to get an approximation of the spinous process. The disc is going to push forward and you're going to have an opening in the front of the, of the body. Okay. In flexion, you're going to have the reverse where the facets are going to open. Okay. And then you're gonna have a uh, closing in the front of the body, opening in the back, back of the body here. And then, um, yeah, you'll see the spinous processes separate. And this is, is you know, pretty obvious, but this is gonna make more sense when I get into some of the motion restrictions in a little bit. So when you side bend, um, so if you're side bending to the right, you're going to have a convergence. So you're actually going to close the facets on the right side and you're going to open the facets on the left side. That's very much like uh, going into uh, uh, extension on the right and flexion on the left. Does that make sense? We're closing the right and opening the left. So we're, if we unilaterally close on one side, we're going to side bend and then we're actually going to rotate to that side too. So rotation is going to involve closing the facet on that side. Okay, so side bent rotation. And then the cervical spine, side bending and rotation are usually coupled to the same side. We'll talk a little bit about Friat's laws. Friat was an osteopath at the turn of the 20th century who uh, really set up the model that um, most osteopaths use to this day on what's happening on um, what's happening in the spine. It's not a perfect model, but clinically it's a really useful model. Um, you know, they, now, you know, we can, we can like 
scan moving bodies with load, without load, and so on. He was doing this with a disarticulated spine with looking at how the facets and the ligaments uh, pulled on it, and that's how he developed these rules. And clinically, they, they bear some fruit. So in the cervical spine, the typical cervical spine, we will see a, a combination of flexion and extension restriction, as well as a side bending and a rotation. So this is how we, the nomenclature that we use in osteopathy for uh, vertebral uh, motion and restrictions. So it says ERS, that means extended, uh, rotated, and side bent. So this is an extension lesion. So when, it, when we call it a lesion or a restriction, we name it for the direction that the segment prefers or joint prefers. Doesn't matter if it's in the vertebral spine, the, the, the vertebra or an elbow or a wrist. Uh, so we name it for what it likes. So when we send it's extended, uh, rotated, side bent to the right, because we know the coupling is the same, we just say ER, ERSR. So that'll be extended, rotated, and side bent to the right. That means that that vertebra, when we go into extension, uh, it'll move very easily. But when you go into flexion, one side, this particular one here, will stay closed. Okay, so the right facet will stay closed instead of opening like we saw earlier. Instead of opening up here, one side will stay closed, the right side, for a right side bending. And so what will happen is the, uh, it'll feel like the vertebra can shift forward, or I mean shift back easily and evenly, but when you go forward, it'll tip. So that's how you can check on a motion thing, or if you can just check by side bending, because this coupling is pretty predictable in the cervical spine. So I'll show you how to do that uh, in a later slide. So we can also have that flexion component. So this vertebra will be symmetrical in flexion, but when you see when it extends, one side will stay open, and that'll be the opposite side from, from the side bending and the rotating. And then I'll, I'll give you a little mnemonic in a moment or a little trick uh, equation how you can remember that. Um, and this is, you know, it's somewhat academic, but if you want to do that like miraculous one needle treatment that Jamie was talking about earlier, this is a great way to do it. If you know which segment, uh, which uh, facet is locked, you can just needle that one segment and you can do kind of like basically an adjustment, osteopathic or chiropractic adjustment with one tiny needle. It works really remarkably well and quite effectively. Uh, I'm, I'm a pretty good, big fan of it. Um, honestly, though, I often will needle both sides because if one side is locked long, then the other is locked short. And what I'm trying to do is restore proprioception at that segment. So it may, you know, it's, it's fun for that, like when you want to wow someone in a crowd, in a, in, a, in a seminar or something like that, or a patient, new patient, you're like, one needle, my neck pain is gone. Um, but in reality, uh, I usually needle both. So this is a flexed uh, restriction. So what's happening is you can see that it's open on the left. So when the cervical spine comes into extension, the right side can come into extension, but the left side can't. It stays in flexion, it stays open. Okay, and that, that open left side is the same as what we'll see on side bending to the right, and, and the same as what we'll see in rotation of the right, right? It's just a point of reference, whether it's, we're talking about open on the left and closed on the right. Well, the, both of those will cause side bending and rotation to the right, if it's closed on the right or open on the left. I'm gonna repeat that a lot of times, but it, it's worth understanding. And this, this goes for the whole spine, and it really does help uh, for, for, to clarify. So I posted this up in the group uh, a couple days ago, or yesterday, or a couple days ago. Um, so this is a, a little mnemonic that Jamie and I came up with over the course of our kind of early conversations. We kind of upped it and upped it and upped it. I don't even remember the other ones because they weren't half as good. But it, when you're treating vertebral restriction, you just need to know your foes. But remember that it's two O's and two S's 
so that if the segment is uh, in a, a extended uh, a fle or sorry flexed position, so that's what the F stands for. That means the opposite uh, uh, side from the side bending and rotation is open. So remember, the opposite from the side bending and rotation is open. So if there's a if there's a flex side bent right, uh, side bend rotated right, that means the left uh, uh, zygopophyseal joint is open. If it's a flex side bent rotated left, it means that the right uh, ZP is open. Okay. If it's extended, it means the same side, the ipsilateral, uh, the ipsilateral zygopophyseal joint is locked uh, shut. So same shut. So this is such a very quick way to remember this. And it's really handy if you're wanting to go forward and uh, needle uh, in, in, uh, in that way, because you can just go boom. Once you do your test, you know if they're more, if the restriction uh, in side bending and rotation becomes more obvious in one position or the other, then you will then be able to think it through. And I'll talk that through in a minute. So, uh, but then you can just needle with one side. So when we're, uh, I like this picture, we're not going to be talking too much about the occiput on C1, but it's useful to know. And you can see that uh, this would be how we would determine the side bending capability of the occiput on C1. The occiput on C1 usually actually is, uh, includes uh, flexion and extension, but side bending rotating to opposite sides most of the time. So that's a more typical. Sometimes in trauma, I see side bending and rotating to the same side, like when people whack, whack their head on like the window in the car in a car accident or like a lateral type or sometimes even some compression type uh, injuries. You can see that side bending and rotating to the same side, but I've only seen that a couple times. Um, but what we're trying to do is we're going to move the occiput, uh, and this principle will be the same. You're going to move the occiput until you feel C1 start to move under your fingers. That's all you're doing. It's really very simple. This is how you do segmental assessment always. You're moving the top segment on the bottom segment, and you're looking at how well that moves. You name it if, there's, uh, if it's not symmetrical, if the movement is not symmetrical, you name it for what it likes. Okay, so that means that if the occiput was extended, side bent right, rotated left, it means when you go into extension, it's gonna, it's gonna side bend really easily to both sides, right? But when you go into flexion and you try to side bend, you're gonna see that dysfunction come out. So you're gonna see, okay, I said side bent right, rotated left. So you're gonna see the side bends ride really easily, but when you try to side bend left, it doesn't like that. You'll feel it'll pull the, uh, it'll pull the upper cervical spine, C1, right into your fingers really fast, okay? This takes a little practice and it's a little hard to get from a, from a seminar, so bear with me. So here we are looking at this, how we would do this at C1. First thing we do is we engage and we go into extension and then we side bend one way, side bend the other way. Notice when we side bend to the, to the uh, left in this case, the chin sort of veers off to the right. That's that opposite rotation. You just kind of watch the chin will tell you the direction of the rotation. So you watch here is the side bending, the chin will give you an idea of where the rotation is. Here's side bending to the right with a little left rotation but you engage extension or flexion first. And that'll, that'll help you know which side is more impacted. Okay. On C1, on C2, the atlas on the axis, AA joint, what you're gonna do is you're gonna have your fingers on the uh, articular pillars of, of our transverse process of C1 and the articular pillar of C2. And you're gonna put the neck into flexion to try to, to lock out the other vertebra. Uh, a little bit. If you put a lot of flexion into the neck, you're, we're not forcefully flexing, but if you put flexion in, it's going to limit their ability to side bend and rotate as much. So you'll get a clearer sense. And what you're going to do then is just rotate C1 on C2 until you feel it, uh, C2 start to move under your uh, middle finger. I usually use my ring and middle finger some, most of the time. It fits really nicely into there. 
This is a really simple and effective way to, to see how well that articulation is moving. Because, you know, neck rotation, like we said, half the neck rotation comes from below. Uh, so it may not be at, at, at uh, C1, C2. But the, the thing to think, remember is that I, I look at the, at the OA joint and the AA joint, um, I call that the miracle mile. And I think that's why every like manual therapy uh, tradition spends a lot of time. I mean, there's schools of chiropractic going back all the way to the beginning where all they adjust is uh, the upper segments. Um, and osteopathy, everybody's probably seen the OA decompression from uh, craniosacral, real common, uh, real common thing there. So um, that being said, this is this would be worth another um, more exploration. But we're going to talk more about the typical cervical spine and how we can treat that uh, for the for the construct of this uh, webinar. Anyway, so. It's the same idea. You're gonna side bend and rotate. You're gonna you're gonna put your fingers. Did I I took out the picture that was helpful? Oh well. Okay. So you're gonna have your fi fingers on the articular pillars. But if you want to know where the articular pillars are, is if you start on your spinous process, and you can just do this along with me. It's pretty an easy palpation. Start at your spinous processes, you go over the lump of the trapezius and semispinalis and all those muscles. And when you drop down into the muscle there, that groove, you'll find that you kind of go into this like fascial cleft right there. If you angle about 45 degrees in, you're on the, your, your uh, articular pillars. And that's really helpful to use with your patients. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna teach how to, how to needle that later. So what you want to do is you want to get on the pillar of the top segment on both hands, and then you're just going to side bend from above down. I know we're at 130. I'm going to be pretty quick here. Um, you're going to you're going to come from side from side to side, and you're going to add that flexion and extension component. The what's what's useful about that is especially in the beginning, uh, being very clear on what needle is doing what it sometimes in the clinic when i'm in a hurry i'll just look at what segments restricted and like i said you can do both sides doop, doop, takes no time it's going to correct it regardless of whether it's an extension or a flexion restriction but just just for your learning i think it is helpful to really do it because you can get uh, a lot more precise and then you know i definitely have those patients where you know they're they're you know they're counting how many needles i'm using you know they're like you've got four needles brother you know so i'm not going to put two on one segment i got one so you know that 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 being said um it's very helpful so really articular pillars and then you just side bend that okay this is takes a lot of practice because you need to really make sure you're you're focusing most of your efforts on, on the segment you're trying to move. Unfortunately, the inter-rater reliability on these things is <laughs> but uh, you can get consistent with yourself and that's kind of more, more helpful, I think. You know, you're, you're the one who has to help your patients. So if you can get useful, reliable information from yourself, um, yeah, they've done some studies with, you know, very, very talented and experienced osteopaths. Uh, and so on, and it, it, the iterator reliability is not not great here. On trigger points, however, it's interesting. I was just reading um, last night. Uh, there has been some studies that show that people who are adequately trained to tr feel the top band. There's about a hundred percent iterator reliability, even for blinded practitioners. That's pretty crazy. So that that's exciting. But segmental stuff's a little trickier. Usually uh, the affected segment will be, will be tight, you'll feel tension in the muscles, and it'll be tender. So, you know, it's not, this is not all like in, in outer space. Okay. So, um, were there any questions before, um, before I go on to treatment? Were there any particular questions I need to look at? Hey Josh, I was just gonna say, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, just for the people watching, I've taken a bunch of different classes on this and 
uh, it was interesting to watch how Josh teaches this in person. It's like ridiculously simple. Like, it just the way you do it is just like, you just rock them side to side. Do, 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 do. You just check it like that. It, it sounds really complicated, but that's like literally, I mean, how long do you spend when you check that? Like maybe like 15 seconds? Maybe? I don't know. It was like super yeah, fast. Yeah. You, can, you, <laughs> yeah. Can check the whole, you can check the whole spine. I just do a rhythmic. I yeah. basically check C1, C2, pull up, rotate, rotate, and I come down, and then I'm checking C1 on C2, or C2 on C3, down to C7 on T1. It's just shift, shift. Next okay. hand, already after I'm going down, the next hand's already down. Yeah, boom, yeah. boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. And yeah. anybody can feel this. It's really not, like, this is, like, the big thing. People make it seem like feeling... Um, like vertebral restrictions and so on is hard. It's the, actually, it's one of the easiest things you can do. It's just motion testing. You're literally, you just have to set your fulcrum. Boom, boom, move down, boom, boom, move down, boom, boom, move down, move down. It takes like, probably the whole neck takes between 10 and 15 seconds to get a sense of, and then you just come back. You're like, oh, it's restricted midway through. You go and you feel that one, and then you can come and you can, add flexion and extension if you want. Or if you're lazy, you just flip them over and needle both. That's that. Don't waste needles. Um, what's that? <laughs> don't waste needles now. Don't waste needles. There's a limited resource, right? <laughs> but yeah, this is good stuff. Were there any other particular questions before? Uh, yeah, OK. So doing the facet acupuncture is really not that different from needling the multifity the way Jamie described it last week. It's pretty much the same technique. Um, so you're, you're going to be about an inch lateral to the uh, spinous process. Uh, and you're going you're gonna to needle about 10 degrees inferiorly, 10 to 20 or 20 to 30 millimeters. Um, sometimes you go a little longer depending on, on uh, the uh, size of the patient. You can go right through, uh, you can get the bonus points and go right through the semispinalis and all that bunch of mu muscles if your patient can tolerate it. Or you can kind of come more from the side in that gutter. You can, you, the facet's right there. I mean, that's what that articular pillar is basically. That's the facet. So if you're angling up under there, you're going to be hitting the, um, the periosteum and also the joint capsule of the facet. So you're you're getting the facet pretty easily here, in which case you really only need you know half inch needle on most people unless they're like football players. Um, so you don't need to you don't need to hit the lamina or anything like that, but you you want to get through the muscle into the um, when you know when you hit like a ligament or a tendon, it's like a little more gummy. That's kind of what all you need. You don't need to you don't need to get that hard bone feel. Uh, it's really simple. So I gave you a lot of talk, but basically in the end, you're just gonna go into points you know, the cervical fatojaji or a little lateral, like I described, where the um, where the that gutter is. So when you come off, there's that space. You're basically right on the 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 uh, articular pillars. You just needle right into there. Um, and you can treat the restricted fessa or both. 10% inferiorly is not as important here because you're a little more lateral. The, um, there's a picture in my last picture. You can kind of see how it's oriented. Like this is, this is a different technique that I'm going to explain in a moment. But if you're really like closer here, you, there's some space here. You can, you can definitely have some risk of being on the cord. If you're out really right over the, the articular pillar, there's nothing to, to hit, as long as you're over the bone. If you come off to the side, you can go, you'll hit scalenes, but then you could be hitting through the brachial plexus and all kinds of other stuff. So just be really clear on your palpation there. It's pretty dang safe, pretty darn safe, but you know, just always, always like to be aware. But then what's fun is to do this, um, treat the restricted facet or both, you know, if, you, if you're in isolation with a partner or something who's got a sore neck, it's great, kind of fun to practice because you can just do the, do the side bending and then test, treat, treat one and then test. All right. The last thing I'm going to talk about is I love this technique. Um, I use it a lot. I love this book, Reinventing Acupuncture. It's a super heretical book. It's probably, you know, one of the first 
English language, uh, you know, native uh, uh, English speakers who practiced acupuncture in the 20th century. Felix Mann, uh, he taught a lot of the early acupuncture courses to physicians in the UK. But at some point, he just was like, points are don't do anything. It's not points. Acupuncture is a systemic thing. And then he started just working regions. I don't know if I totally buy exactly what into what he says. However, there is a lot to be said for the regional approach. And some of his techniques are really effective. They're really gentle and um, really pretty simple to use. So one he talks about is needling the articular pillar, which is uh, and pecking the periosteum. So he does periosteal pecking. Um, which uh, there are other people teaching this, uh, but this really comes from him. Um, and so what you wanna do is you wanna get onto the, uh, per the uh, pillar. Uh, I usually do this one side lying, and you're, using, you're getting into that gutter I described, and you're using about a 45, 30, 45 degree angle. You usually don't need a very long needle uh, to do this. And what you're going to do is you're going to peck on the, on the transverse process, uh, on, the, on the articular pillar here of uh, C2 through C6, C7. Uh, you can choose the restricted vertebra, or if you want to have a more systemic effect, you just use C2 or C3. That's enough. And when you get this just right, it's a really particular de chi that people are going to feel. They're actually going to um, feel a spreading uh, warmth. Uh, or pressure, which can go like up towards the head, towards the jaw, to the front of the neck, up or down the neck. It can go into anywhere in the upper extremity. Um, it's just some kind of an amazing, very simple technique to use uh, for any problem above the diaphragm, uh, he claims. I haven't used it for that. I've used it mostly for sort of more recalcitrant uh, neck pain. Uh, restriction that just isn't releasing from a muscular uh, standpoint. I just can't seem to get it to go. Um, or uh, shoulder and upper extremity problems. So usually, you know, that's it. You peck just real lightly at, at the periosteum. Hopefully you can get that sensation. If it's painful, you need to like either use a smaller needle or back off uh, and, and try again. And you just Tuck, 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 you know, just kind of move it around and peck the periosteum along there. Very safe, usually really well tolerated, works great. Okay, so um, that's what I want to say on that. Um, were there any questions on this? It's hard to demonstrate here, uh, either for me or Jamie. I'm trying to see here. I'm trying to monitor. I didn't see too many questions. Okay. All right. Well, it seems, it seems pretty good. So um, I just would, would like to thank you all for spending, you know, your part of your time off here uh, with us. And, um, you know, when you get back to the clinic, try this stuff, let us know how it works for you please you know shoot us questions either personally or in the group i like the group just because this stuff comes out in the discussion um and uh yeah anything else jamie no um just want to say thank you to everybody tuning in and um special thanks to you josh for just you know hooking this up making this happen um appreciate you and what your you know your experience and what you've been sharing with everybody um, like I was kind of mentioning earlier, you, know, you study with different people and everybody has their own thing to offer, but I just appreciate how you simplify some very complex things that can take me personally years to figure out on my own. So just, yeah, I just appreciate you sharing what you've been putting out there and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to learning more from everyone, including you. Awesome. Thanks everyone. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.